welcome back to the second half of today's morning session. Our next keynote speaker, he is the Associate Vice Provost, Stanford University, Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. He has spent 29 years in various roles at Stanford and currently directs a portfolio of over 250 graduate and professional courses annually in, to industry. He has been instrumental in developing and implementing an international portfolio which includes Singapore, China, India, Korea, Malaysia, Brazil, United Arab Emirates, and in numerous European countries, including France, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. In 2013, he launched a joint online non-credit certificate program between the School of Engineering and Graduate School of Business, the Stanford Innovation and Entrepreneurship Certificate. This is the first formal online education cooperation between the schools. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Paul Marker. Well, good morning again. I hope you, uh, your break was satisfactory. You've got a little bit of food in you now. You're ready to listen or fall asleep, depending upon how much energy I bring. Um, I want to thank uh, Kun Tapani for bringing me here. Uh, we actually have, thank you very much, I'm delighted to be here and share a few things, perspectives from Stanford University. And what I would like to focus on my talk mostly is about the beyond portion of the title. Stanford is, was one of the first to deliver on massively open and online courses in 2011, and so we have some history there. I'll share a little bit of that, but I hope to challenge you around the strategy and perspectives that your universities should be thinking about. Um, I do have to share one of the reasons we're back in Thailand. This is my fifth visit to Thailand, uh, and we have, uh, with our partner SEAC, uh, and uh, Kun Pupe is here to share some perspective uh, if you want to meet her in the hallways. Um, we have developed uh, an executive education program, first of all, focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, really, we're building capacity in the leaders of those who participate in our programs. And we know that capacity building in Thailand, resilience and perspective is really important. Those executives uh, saw that there's great opportunity to work with Stanford to scale this innovation and entrepreneurship content, and that's where SEAC comes in. We have great content. Our partner SEAC has context, a local context, and combining those two, we have found in our programs around the globe is really important, and so we're delivering that. That has led to uh, a research opportunity uh, focused on Thailand 4.0. We've been excited and delighted to learn about that initiative. And our faculty now will be coming back to Thailand to focus on research first and executive education second. So that's how we have been here. We've been uh, thrilled to get to know many of the companies. We met with the government officials over the last two days. So I'll bring some of that perspective to my talk as well. So I, I begin with this uh, photograph here uh, well, actually, this, this agenda, here's what I plan to do over the next 40 minutes or so. Give you some context, talk about the past, especially the Stanford story, provide some uh, updates on the present, what's happening now, and also share some thoughts about the future and make some bold predictions. I, in some of them, I hope I'm wrong, but others, I will uh, welcome your input and uh, thoughts. So a little bit about the context. So I, I recently took this photograph uh, here in Thailand, in fact, and many of you are smiling. You probably recognize this, right? Does this need disrupting? What do you think? Is there an opportunity here? It's sort of obvious, right? You can imagine uh, the uh, carriers who have to figure out which line is bad. <laughs> Just think about that effort, right? How about this? This is my alma mater, 
uh, the place that I love, the place that I've spent nearly now 30 years. Thank you for that uh, introduction. I actually think this needs more disrupting than the lines that you saw, and I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll, I'll share why I think that's the case. Even though it's clean and pristine, there's lots of work that we can do as educators to think about extending and expanding our uh, activities. I think Willem hit it right on the head. At Stanford, we believe we have an obligation to do this, given our position uh, in the Silicon Valley and the great benefit that we have. So that's in part why we're here in Thailand, we've been in China, and, and so on. So, um, so with those framing thoughts, um, one of the things that I've felt, and maybe you feel it as well, things are moving really fast these days. Oh my goodness, there are courses all over the place. I, I did some, some work and I uh, pulled some uh, statistics which I thought were interesting to demonstrate the speed of change these days. Um, 127 new devices are connected to the internet every second, collecting data often, uh, either from systems or from us as uh, individuals, as consumers, as people who just get on the bus. They know where, we're on, where we are and how we got on and how frequently and so on. Lots of systems connecting to the internet and enabling technology. 375 million workers, and this is some, some uh, uh, content taken from uh, BCG and McKinsey study. Um, 375 million workers over the next decade or more will be displaced by automation. Now, in some cases, that's great news. Uh, manual labor uh, is difficult, and if we can use robots to be more efficient, uh, that would be terrific. It's a, it's a great opportunity for us as universities to provide ongoing and continuous education, that lifelong learning that Willem mentioned. It is also a huge risk, I would say. Imagine if you had that many people who did not have a job, could not provide for their family, and then become sort of frustrated and angry with the system. Right? That's the big risk that I see. We need to, as, uh, as universities, think about this and how do we mitigate, help provide a portion of the solution to mitigate or reduce this risk. A third of our jobs will be uh, in, done in part by automation. And the example I use is my marketing person. Our center delivers curriculum to uh, many people across the globe. And, what we do is we track those people through their progress. Ten years ago, we would say, uh, we know that you have completed two courses. We'd have to pull manually from our database and have somebody manually send you an email, say, sign up for the third course so you can finish your certificate in data mining. Today, we do that automatically using uh, an automated drip campaign system called Marketo, uh, a Stanford-founded startup uh, that was just acquired. And, and that system allows her, as a marketing professional, to do other things, more high-value things than pulling lists and managing manually the distribution of that content. Thinking more strategically, 90% of the CEOs expect disruption to occur in their companies and here's the bad news, 70% of those same CEOs say their employees are not ready. Again, another great opportunity to provide, for example, the content that we do in innovation and entrepreneurship, which starts to deliver uh, perspectives on resilience. I would also mention that uh, the turbulence is increasing. Uh, if, you, if your company was founded uh, before 1940, you had an, uh, a pretty good chance of living for 90 years. If your company is founded in the last decade, it's very likely you'll be out of business in 10. You'll be acquired or you'll be done because of the competition is so fierce. The cycles of change are increasing. On a personal note, I had one boss for 23 years and I've had seven bosses in the last seven years. So we have to start building the arguments. We have to be very nimble and on our feet. You'll notice I'm walking to try to keep, keep things moving. I've been able to duck and jive, and so far we're good. Uh, but there's a lot of work that is implied here as well to try to provide uh, perspective on the work that we're doing, especially for me in extended education. Um, if you don't believe me, just think about what's happening outside the university environment. Um, the largest hotel chain, Airbnb, has no buildings. 
They have no infrastructure, no costs, no overhead associated with this. They're simply playing matchmaker between uh, people who have open spaces around the globe and people who want to go and avail themselves of those great locations. They're also collecting inordinate amounts of data on us. That platform allows them to see what searches and what countries and what areas are of interest. So who needs a hotel room anymore? Airbnb is much more convenient. The largest music distributor, now you could call it Apple, it's Spotify, they, they don't actually manage any recording artists. They don't have to deal with uh, rec recording studios and the um, artist hassle, the sort of attitude that comes with being famous, right? They simply capture what the record companies are doing, those producers, and they give it to us. Apple Computer provides 70% of the revenue back to the record companies, and they don't have to do a thing. They keep 30% of the revenue. Who has the data, though? Apple Computer knows the trends, knows what people are searching on, and so on. So we, if we leverage these external platforms, we risk losing the insight that we might be able to gather. The largest retailer, Taobao, or Amazon, depending upon your perspective, uh, has no physical presence. They simply matchmake between those who have goods and those who want goods, and they do it extremely efficiently with delivery. And you can imagine very soon, especially with Willem's uh, graphic about the global distribution, who the heck needs a building called a campus anymore? How many of you actually are uh, on, on a physical campus and connect with colleagues? Raise your hand. How many of you are in the education business, edu and I call it a business by design? How many of you in the education business? Raise your hand. Okay, I got three people. <laughs> Help me out here, folks. So, as I understand it, a lot of us are in the education business, right? Maybe you're too shy to raise your hand. Um, it's a fairly provocative question. What on earth do you need? So um, Stanford University extends our content not just to, uh, to industry, which we do very well, but we also enable uh, students to go overseas, and they never have to show up to class because we can extend the content. So could you imagine if you can do one year's worth of online education and never having stepped foot on the Stanford campus, why on earth would you need to be there? I think this starts to illustrate the point. Universities, uh, administrators, faculty need to think about the value that they're bringing and contributing to those people who do show up to the physical campus. They also need to consider the audience outbound, which may be very soon many more than those who are on the physical campus. As an example, Stanford University serves 16,000 students a year. Our program enrolls 25,000 paid enrollments, and we have to date serviced 6 million people online through our MOOCs since 2012. Far more than, uh, than the physical Stanford campus can provide or, or actually want to, to, uh, to deal with. So this notion of, uh, of a campus is something that we need to consider. I, I give you some perspective on, on the past, here is the, uh, one of the first university, uh, first and oldest active university. Universities were constructed as, uh, for place-based education. It's a place that you would go. It would house the very valuable books. And it would give, uh, especially um, in the early days, a focus around religion and perspective. And, and here we have one of the first universities founded, interestingly, by a woman. Uh, which is always great to bring that diversity in perspective. But this place-based education is changing, I would argue. Um, this guy here, does anybody know who this guy is? Raise your hand if you, maybe it's just a couple of Silicon Valley folks. This guy's name is Frederick Terman. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the Frederick Terman story. I, I love stories. Just to give you some perspective on what he was able to do for Stanford University moving us from a good regional university to a great international university. And there's some really important lessons here. So he, be, he arrived on Stanford's campus in 1925. He was an engineering professor, a radio engineering professor, and he wrote a seminal book in this space. 
uh, when World War II broke out, he decided to give back to his country. So he went to the Department of Defense on the East Coast and provided some perspective on this uh, radio engineering, how you could jam the enemy signals uh, for, from those uh, bombers that would come in and so on and so forth. Um, based on that experience, he came back to the School of Engineering at Stanford and became one of the very first deans in the School of Engineering, the third dean, in fact. Frederick Terman, uh, based on his de Department of Defense experience, then was able to leverage that network to bring to Stanford research funding. That was really important. This was one of the first times that research, government research funding had come back to Stanford. What did that do? You can imagine. Research funding, faculty love to do research and have it funded, right, even today. That attracted great students. So suddenly, that funding generated the activity and the, the creation of, of Stanford as a center, as a, as a magnet for some of the great faculty and also from, for some of the great students. He also famously sponsored two students, a guy by the name of William Hewlett and a guy by the name of David Packard, of Hewlett and Packard, right? That was the famous story that you all have heard of. I'm gonna come back to that connection, but very soon what he did uh, in partnership with them and three other uh, org uh, companies, he started to, uh, Terman started to realize that engineers, especially engineers, needed to be constantly educated. Today, a computer science engineer is obsolete in three years. If you're not constantly getting educated in an engineering discipline, then you will be behind. And so Terman saw this and wanted to help his friends and the companies in the Silicon Valley. So he started to create graduate uh, degrees, non-degree certificates, and focus his attention on connecting Stanford and industry. So he created a government connection by the funding. He's now creating and reaching out to industry as one of the, he was the second provost at Stanford University. So, that's the, the Terman story. I love this quote here. He talked about the Silicon Valley. There wasn't much there. It was a bunch of fruit orchards, right? And after he exited, uh, uh, he, the, the world wanted to come to the Silicon Valley. I want to take this quote a step further. I think now the Silicon Valley has an obligation to go to the world. And we have a great uh, mode, means of, of doing this, which is online education. So um, our center, the center is really uh, charged to educate a global community. We do that by leveraging our Stanford faculty uh, content. We also partner and engage industry experts to develop our portfolio. We have, as was mentioned, 200 graduate courses a year. We deliver 50 to 60 professional courses, and we also work with governments, the UAE, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the government of Malaysia, the government of Thailand, and so on, to think about the challenges that they have and explore ways that we can uh, invigorate uh, the community, especially around innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, th this timeline is really interesting. There's been a lot of talk about dates and so on and who, who did what first. I just want to share with you the Stanford story. Um, and the, I, I've been in this organization uh, for my entire professional life, so I can say that these, are, these dates are reasonably accurate. In 1954, I mentioned uh, uh, Terman's connection with industry, we created an honors cooperative program, HCP program. Now, Stanford was founded in 1891, so, you know, roughly the half-life of the university, uh, we created this strong education connection with industry. Based on that connect, the students would come to Stanford's campus, they would drive in, the traffic wasn't as bad as it is today. Uh, but they would come to campus and rub shoulders with the students there and take uh, master's degrees, and in some cases, PhDs as well. In 1969, uh, the School of Engineering builds a television network. Um, that was the genesis of, of our center, the Instructional Television Network. So now students didn't have to drive to Stanford. We could broadcast the signals to them, and we had an innovative two-way talkback system. So we'd get 
questions from industry students for those who participate. It was really cool. Uh, in fact, we're trying to get a project that will re reinvigorate that using likely Zoom as the technology. So that was 1969. In 1995, uh, my first boss, Dr. Andy DiPaolo, uh, founded the Stanford Center for Professional Development to, expend, to, to allow us to grow our activities, not just graduate education, not just delivered with the instructional television network, but rather uh, a flexible approach. Uh, soon thereafter, oops, we, we worked with um, a couple of technology uh, and, and a couple of pilots to deliver the first online master's degree in engineering education. We've been at this for a long time. You know, MOOCs were invented in 20, uh, 2008 or something, 2011, depending upon your, your dates that you like. We've been at the online master's degree for longer than most. Um, we learned a lot. Uh, we offered um, the Based on our ability to deliver online content, I said, let's, let's develop professional programs uh, of the sort that Willem talked about and deliver an advanced project management program, which we just closed down after roughly 20 years. The faculty member retired. Uh, but this program uh, allowed us to partner with an industry uh, uh, group, work with our faculty to extend and expand uh, the great work that they were doing and deliver a professional certificate all in uh, 1999 and 2000. We think that that's the first online blended professional certificate that we know of. And I, if you know of anyone that came earlier, let, let me know and I'll, I'll change that. So um, we did uh, Stanford Engineering Everywhere in 2007. We were using Creative Commons. We had a grant from a venture capital f uh, company. It was uh, $500,000. We built 10 courses fully scalable with Creative Commons, homeworks, assignments. Anybody in the world could download this, and we had about 1.9 million hits and downloads. Uh, it wasn't sustainable, though. That's a big number, 500,000 for 10 courses. It's probably about average in terms of the cost. But I think the, the point is that um, we, we, we proved success. We declared victory, and we said, can't do any more of that. It's too expensive. It's not sustainable. Um, we did in 2011 with uh, Sebastian Trun, uh, Jennifer Widom, and of course the famous Andrew Ng. How many of you have heard of Andrew Ng? Uh, okay, well, I got, I got four people. Four? Y'all should get on and look at Coursera. He was the founder of Coursera. He has the most famous course there in, in artificial intelligence. Anyway, enough about that. But we are at a MOOC conference here, right? Okay. Um, so he was, the, the three of them delivered the, the first Stanford MOOCs, and we had 350,000 enrollments, and, a, and tens of thousands completed that. It was Stanford-level content. So it makes sense that you have such a drop-off in the enrollments. It was relatively difficult. They took a graduate course, and they uh, reduced the intensity by a little bit, but they, it was difficult. So tens of thousands have completed. I, I mentioned our 25,000 enrollments in 2015. And at 2016, I think it was really important, um, based on our MOOC experience and a number of activities, as Willem suggested, the university took, it took a step back and we created in 2012 the Vice Provost for Online Learning. And then in 20, uh, I guess 2015, the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, where I currently sit. And that unit was designed to think about how Stanford could build a strategy around uh, this online learning, not only to benefit the extended learner, those, that person outside of the campus, but also that person, the, the faculty members inside of the campus, who might want to take advantage of the new technology and also benefit the students to give them flexibility to go overseas. So that's the way that we developed this unit. We, we, our center, which was in the School of Engineering for these many years, joined the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. A couple things. First, if you look at the dates here, you'll notice that there are a lot more dates uh, stacked, and that's a lot more variability. I, I don't know about you, but we're sensing a, a lot of movement. So this gives you some sense of, of the history. Let me move uh, quickly to the present the kinds of things that uh, we're talking about today. So um, the, the great thing is the, the, the Thailand's cyber initiative, this is just a wonderful opportunity. The government is actually uh, sponsoring this and really involved and engaged. 
That's not the case in the United States of America today. I'll, I'll talk a little about the history and then share the, what, what I see. The, the, the government, um, as I mentioned in the case with um, Frederick Terman, was sponsoring lots of research for lots of uh, universities uh, throughout its history. They still sponsor research today. And that symbiotic relationship with, would generate interest in great students from universities. And Hewlett and Packard would uh, create a business nearby the university. It was a great symbiotic relationship. In fact, Hewlett Packard, when they decided about global overseas locations, what they would do is they would develop campuses near universities, really good universities. So if you track the locations of the HP headquarters overseas, it's always near a great campus because they knew that they needed to get great talent and they could find it at the university. They needed trained engineers. They needed access to ongoing education to benefit their company. By contrast, the university benefited from that tight relationship because they could have uh, and bend the content to relevant industry interest. And governments won because they supported the university. They got tax benefit. So it was a great symbiotic relationship. Well, today, at least in the US and also in Europe, this, this is separating the, the, the connective tissue that was so important to the Silicon Valley's creation, Stanford, HP, uh, and the university. Uh, is, is starting to fracture. And what we're seeing is governments, for example, in the state of California, the sixth largest economy in the world, one of the best public university systems accessible, uh, the UC Berkeley, UC uh, California system, UC Berkeley, UCLA, uh, and so on. They're not nearly getting as much funding from the government. They're having to increase tuition. And the value proposition is going away. They cannot provide education for the citizens of California. They're, in fact, importing more uh, uh, foreign uh, students in order to cover the costs, the, the, the tuition gap that they have. This is a big problem. Universities, in turn, are not getting as much research dollars. They're having to look inward to think about uh, how to do more with less funding, with less material. They have more students as well. So it's getting complicated. It's getting difficult for universities to operate. They're, in fact, talking to folks like Willem and, and me to generate revenue on the existing assets, to produce revenue in, in a more, increasingly more important ways. Industry, uh, well, they, you know what? They don't need us anymore. I make that bold statement. It's probably not true. But I say that to maybe wake you up if you're enjoying your uh, uh, just a little nap here. Industry uh, can take advantage of all the courses that are online, the massively open and online courses, and they can simply watch those pay a low cost to Coursera or to other aggregator at Open edX, and they can educate their, their teams as they go. You heard from Willem that he had, uh, he's already working with companies to try to give them the education bits that the millennials want. So the market is changing. The industry doesn't need the education from the universities as it once did. So the dependence is, is and this is definitely true for uh, United States and also for, um, for Europe, not so much for Thailand, which is great news. So while you have that, take advantage. It's, it's in this gap, it's in this gap here that education technology companies and investments are occurring. These, these are three Stanford-founded startups. Uh, you probably have heard of Udacity, founded by one of the fa uh, faculty members at Stanford, uh, who was an adjunct faculty, Sebastian Trun, a famous guy. He had done a lot of work at Google and so on, and he wanted to democratize education. He wanted to make the Stanford course that he taught in artificial intelligence available to everybody, right? And so what he did is create a company to do this. He stepped away from Stanford and created and founded Udacity. And their goal was to try to build more intense and intimate relationships with companies like Google to take advantage uh, of this. He famously connected with Georgia Tech and also a large telecom provider, AT&T, in the United States. AT&T gave the funding 
to start the master's degree, a professional master's degree that Georgia Tech is running. My good friend Nelson Baker, uh, the Dean of Continuing and Professional Studies at Georgia Tech, uh, has been involved in this uh, activity. UDES, Georgia Tech now delivers more master's degrees based on this single program, uh, that it's a, a professional master's in computer science, than any other university, maybe in, in combined, but certainly the CS degrees awarded by Georgia Tech, enabled by Udacity, more than anybody on the planet. 3,000 a year, 3,000 graduates a year in computer science master's degree, stunning. Coursera, another Stanford-founded uh, startup, funded, generously funded, they're on their fourth round now, they're gonna go public, don't tell them I told you. Uh, they have a CEO, a Stanford graduate, a terrific guy, they're doing really great work. They're thinking about providing from the genesis of the massively open and online courses, they're delivering uh, specializations, lots of other things, and I'll talk about that case in a, in a moment. And NovoEd was another fa Stanford-founded startup, Amin Sabiri, Management Science and Engineering. They initially were a catalog of courses, but they were focused on trying to build uh, groups and active learning, uh, Willem mentioned this, active learning online groups. So there now have become a platform. Our own Graduate School of Business leverages NovoEd to build little uh, groups that can have discussions and so on. So these, in this gap, th there also NovoEd is working with industry. Again, why does industry need us? Um, in this gap, these three companies have emerged, and I think that the, there will be more to come, many more to come if you follow the investment in the education technology space. Um, the universities were, have been, from our perspective, been thinking about uh, lots of future-focused experiments in this sort of present day. Uh, just a few of them, Coursera, I mentioned, Udacity uh, has a nano degree with a job guarantee. What they were doing is, if you didn't get a job, they refunded the cost of your tuition uh, to them. So I'm not sure about a job guarantee, but anyway, a, a refund if you didn't get a job. Many people are thinking about, and this is really healthy, I think, what does the future of the university look like? What is our value? What is our obligation? The Gates Foundation has spent a lot of time funding courses. Georgetown, uh, Stanford, of course. I particularly like Arizona State. If you, haven't, if you don't know Arizona State University, uh, uh, Michael Crow, the president, has done a spectacular job in setting a future state. Please go look at his website. Amazingly great work. Right? I think Stanford is, is doing some work as well, I'd, I'd like to think, but um, I'm really impressed with Arizona State. And from the top down, this has been a great, uh, great effort. Um, a lot of universities are thinking about, sorry, uh, the credentials, um, both uh, professional credentials as well as formal credentials. Um, the proliferation of this is just stunning. You can get a credential in anything, really. It's amazing. And there are, more, there are again, more that, that we think uh, will be coming. So the future. I, I think I want to spend a little bit of time here uh, on the future, and I have uh, about 10 minutes, uh, and then I'll open it up to questions. I hope that I'm generating some questions, and if not, I'm gonna be more controversial. So think about those questions. So, the future. Um, we, we think a future portfolio is, is an interesting approach. We have worked for three years to get this uh, almost approved at Stanford University. It, I, th I think that, the sort of, I would point to this top section. Everybody in this, if you're part of a university, you know the, the deal of the, of the Stanford credit, the university degree and so on, the connective tissue between the master's degree, individual courses, uh, certificates and so on. So that's a known thing. What's, what's less clear and in fact is a little bit of the Wild West is the rest of it, right? So you had these MOOCs. And, and if you go on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. And if you go on LinkedIn right now, uh, there's a bunch of people who have a uh, LinkedIn, they took Andrew Ng's course, right? And they sort of put their, like, they got a, now they're a Stanford graduate because they took a LinkedIn, I mean, they, they have a, uh, on LinkedIn, they have a credential. And they, they sort of say, Stanford, you know, I took one course from Stanford, it was a MOOC. Maybe I had my sister do the course that's, <laughs> as opposed to me. And now they're claiming somehow they have a connection. So we, we segmented this in, so we know these people, they're verified. These professional program opportunities, a certificate of completion, or a certificate of achievement, and a professional certificate, these are the, this is the non-credit domain. 
but we're very interested in those people. And then we have this platform where we, so we can, we can, we know these people, we can identify them and we have an understanding of who they are. These people we don't know, right? We have no idea. You may say you took a MOOC, but I'm well, not sure, maybe your brother did the test or something, you know, how do you validate that? It's very, very difficult at this point. So I, I think it, I, I mentioned this because the university has predominantly for the last maybe thousand years focused here. I think the opportunity the, and, and the real um, traction could be right here. I would argue that uh, the, the degree is no longer a four or eight year degree. It's a 40 or 50 year degree. If you think about the millennials uh, group that have graduated or those that will graduate, it's likely that they'll have not two or three careers. I've had, I had five jobs, different jobs at Stanford, but they'll have five completely separate disciplines they'll have to manage, they'll have to learn and grow new perspective and new skills, and they'll be, they'll be looking to us as universities to provide that. I, I think that this area will do that. I'm not, I'm not gonna leave my job to go back to university for two or three years. I'm not gonna do it. I have a job, I may have a family, I like making money, I can go out and buy a nice meal for my colleagues or for my friend or significant other. I'm not going back to the university. University needs to come to me with a flexible offering and we think this credentialing area will be rich. If, for as an example, Stanford graduates 5,000 people up here in bachelor's, master's, and PhDs every year, we may have 50,000 graduating with a certificate or a credential every year. That's, that's where I'd like to go. We have now, I mentioned 20, 25,000. We'll have 30,000 enrollments in our professional programs. Uh, we, we think that that's gonna scale. Um, Coursera is the competition. In seven years, they have built an install base of 31 million users. They have about 500,000 paid. If you do the math on that, it's about point, it's, it's exactly what a marketing list might give you in terms of email marketing, right? So they're, they're leveraging their list. It's a Stanford faculty, Andrew Ng and Daphne Kohler founded that company. Neither one is, no, is, is engaged, in part because they've generated about $200 million in venture capital investment, and the VCs want their money back, right? They're gonna think about expanding from free MOOCs to degree, and doing everything in between, providing these flexible credentials, they're gonna provide the best possible product at the lowest possible cost. They have many more engineers than we do. I can't compete with their technology and their approach. We leverage them, we also leverage other platforms and technology so that we can uh, learn more. We, um, keep your friends close and your competitors closer, I would say. And finally, they're starting to compete with the companies that we engage. They're talking with Hewlett Packard. We talk with Hewlett Packard. They're selling Andrew Ng's course to, to, to HP at the $75 rate. I sell that same course for actually $4,000, a graduate uh, master's degree level course. Which one do you think HP is gonna take? <laughs> Roughly the same content, right? Education is, is, we'll talk about that. So, so they're competing with us. They're bundling our content, they're taking advantage of many of our brands, and they have a better offer than we do. So seven predictions, and then some recommendations. So education is becoming a commodity. Now many faculty don't like to hear that. My stuff is unique, I'm very special. Not really, no, mm -mm. I can search online, I can find anybody, I can compare and contrast uh, lectures and presentation styles. Game over. Think Amazon, think Taobao, think any platform that will allow me to compare and contrast. I'm gonna go for the best quality at the lowest possible price. You'll use the same mentality that you use to buy anything. And the universities have to wrestle with this. Companies will craft their own curriculum. They don't need us. You know, I, I think we had a, a conversation with a company in Europe. They'd never actually seen online stuff. They came to us in 2012. Now they have a full robust portfolio. They no longer engage with us. They don't need us. Training will dominate. Companies will have 
specific activities they would like to focus on. And training will dominate. You've heard of these boot camps. I want to learn how to code. Let's go do a boot camp. That's going to be great. Okay? Here's the risk, though. Universities provide broader perspective, how to think about a problem. Training is not education. Universities educate. We teach people how to think critically about a problem, be thoughtful about potential solutions. Training provides me uh, the ability to do some specific task in some given period of time. This is a risk. Universities will need to reinvent their value. If you believe the story that education is a commodity, we need to think about place-based education as a great opportunity to experiment with blended learning, to scale the activity with our companies, to provide additional benefit. In short, we need to question that value. We need to think about where the, fu where the ball is headed, where, where the future is going, and how we can experiment and pilot ways to get there. And in fact, I think uni units like ours can provide some perspective on that reinvention. We're talking. I talked with the um, Department of International Trade and Promotion yesterday. We're thinking about ways to engage here in Thailand, uh, how we might experiment with them to do some things. I'm talking with industry uh, on a fairly consistent basis. Uh, we have uh, great conversations uh, with faculty in the university who want to think about different ways to engage. Our unit, in short, could be uh, the potential uh, uh, pilot and experiment. If it doesn't work, I'll take the hit for the lack of uh, success. If it does work, uh, we want to right be there and take that lesson and scale that lesson inside of Stanford. Credentials will become more valued than degrees. It's a simple uh, rule of numbers. The degree will be important. The credential will allow me to maintain my job for a period of uh, 50 to 60 years, which is what the, the period will, will be for, for those of us, uh, those graduating and into entering the world of work. And then finally, the, the master, age of master teachers is near. Uh, Andrew Ng, he was the first mover advantage in artificial intelligence. He's now the most famous guy. He's creating uh, content. He wants to create a master's degree. He's the guy. He's the rock star in this space. And universities should think about Who's our rock star, and what can we do? So a few recommendations. Um, and I have just a few minutes here. Uh, lifelong learner. Uh, we, we think it's this 40-year degree, 50-year degree. And universities have an obligation to understand that the, it's about the perspective of the consumer, not necessarily the perspective of a student who has uh, limited rights and privileges. We need to think more broadly about the life, this person who's on our campus will become a future customer, uh, and I mean customer of ours, because it's about the consumer relationship. Universities are changing and shifting. We have to develop and deepen our industry relationships. We've got to know what they're thinking. I had time for 40, mi 40 minutes, so anyway, we started a little late. Um, we have to consider what we can do on the campus to practice, to learn, to, to, to learn and grow. The, the data is really important. And if we're giving it to Coursera or Udacity or other companies, we're not benefiting unless we've written the contract very carefully. So you won't get the insights that you need in order to build a future university unless you have the data. So think about what you can do inside your university with experiments. If you're a unit like mine, don't innovate. Faculty innovate. We're a service provider. We have to help support experiments. Think about the lab infrastructure. That's, that's how I think about our unit. If you go out and say we're going to innovate and reinvent the future of the university, boy, you will get shot down quicker than you can say bang. Uh, focus on faculty strengths. Build programs that leverage the heck out of your particular expertise. I love the example that Willem gave around uh, solar. For us, it's artificial intelligence. Right? We have an unbelievable faculty in that space, and we should be owning that. And finally, um, you know, it's, while there's lots of challenges and lots of turmoil in this era of disruption, I leave you with what I think is a, is a quite positive quote by Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. 
right? Uh, uh, so we're, we're, I'm delighted to have presented a few thoughts. I think we're all part of the community. I want to make sure that we can learn from each other. Uh, I look forward to maybe coming back again. I, I'm disappointed I didn't come earlier because you have been pioneers in this uh, space. I'm, I'm part of the International Association for Continuing Engineering Education, uh, which is a global organization. The, uh, I attend the World Engineering Education Forum, which was recently held in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, we'd be delighted to share lessons so that we can become a small, tight-knit group of uh, a community to, to make a dramatic change, a change in, the, in education in an era of disruption. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we are a few minutes late uh, behind the schedule, but uh, we started late, as you mentioned, so I think it's fair enough to give Professor uh, Paul Mecca floor for any questions from the audiences, please. Questions, <laughs> emotional outbursts, challenges. Uh -huh. Stunned silence. Yes. Don't call microphone. If yeah, if you just get microphone coming. Hi. Uh, thank you, Professor, for um, a very nice presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, perhaps Stanford has um, come up with research or surveyed on the perception between online degrees and um, uh, institutionalized um, on-site degrees. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, um, can you enlighten us on the perception from, from perhaps uh, US point of view yep. compared to have you heard on um, uh, Asian point of view because one of the thing, one of the challenges that we had actually, when you offer a program, now we are offering courses mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. But when you offer an online programs like Master of Science or Master's degree in Electronics Engineering, for example, a fully hands-on course like that, te technical courses like that, programs like that, people would say that you 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 don't have enough hands-on experience. Um, so do share with us. So a cu couple things. First, uh, th thank you for the question. Um, I, I think I would characterize it as sort of maybe a little bit about the value of, of that vis-a-vis -vis the on-campus experience and the hands-on uh, component. Um, we have found that um, a couple of studies that we conducted. First, there is no difference between an online master's degree in electrical engineering and on campus in terms of the results of the students. So that's a study we have conducted uh, to, in order to maintain our, um, our accreditation. So we have to prove that. We leverage the curriculum, we extend it to industry. They achieve the same or even, fa in fact, better grades than the on campus students. So that's the first thing. The second is, uh, it turns out that the experience in the companies, many of those have far better facilities for hands-on lab work and so on than, than we do at Stanford. You can imagine Intel, uh, for example, right down the road has far better facilities in terms of their labs to, to conduct electrical engineering experiments. And so we, we work with the company in the particular area to try to think about ways to enable that hands-on experience. I think the other thing is the degree that we extend uh, especially, is really valued. I, I, often you, get, you go through the path in the university and you don't really understand why am I doing these courses, they make no sense. The person in the world of work has a far richer perspective and can bring that to the table. They have gone through the life experience and they're thinking about an opportunity. A, the, the education is, the, is a means to an end. For, for the student on the residential campus, it's the, end, the end is the degree itself. And then they sort of figure out, okay, now what do I do? So it, it's actually, in fact, much more valuable. And we found uh, much more tangible results uh, because of this. Thank you for the question. Yes, we have a question right here. I don't know where the microphone went. 
I'd throw one to you, but I, I don't know, might <laughs> land. And... Uh, first of all, I, thank you very much for your nice presentation. And I'd like to share with you, I think the first one is MOOC. MOOC, in my view, I think MOOC is trying to build a, a multimedia content to the, to the student, right? And then for your topic, you're talking about the beyond. Beyond is mean now we try to build the multimedia content. It means that we try to make the, our student autonomous or automation, right? And I think AI or artificial intelligence will be the, the near future that become a teacher. And I like to see your opinion how to apply the AI to the MOOC system. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the great thing about massively open online courses is it generates an enormous amount of data on the students. And so you, you can actually think about mining that data for keen insights. I think that's where AI might be able to provide support. Uh, my, my good friend Nelson Baker at Georgia Tech has used AI uh, on the customer service side of the equation to think about ways to provide automated answers to frequently asked questions. So they've used the, the data, they've figured out the questions, and now they're using AI on the customer support side. I think what you're suggesting is could we use it to generate content? Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, I haven't thought deeply about that, but on its surface, you could imagine that an intelligent agent could search all of our content, pull the best stuff, and provide a curated experience that's even better than any one individual course, right? That's the opportunity that I see. That's why I think Coursera is the competition. They actually have those courses. All they need to do is convince the universities to allow them to aggregate that content. It's, it's, it's really interesting thought. I, they're doing some work in medicine uh, along these lines as well. The computer can pass a medical exam in China, apparently. So. China better increase the intensity of that test, or uh, you know, the, 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 what, what, what does the human value contribute? I think, for me, it goes very quickly back to value. Uh, how can we, as humans, provide more value on top of the systems that are helping us, enabling us to do great things? Other questions? I may have exceeded the time limit here. Yes. Okay, one more. So this is probably the last question. Thank you. We have a uh, mic question here. Do we have a mic? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maka. It's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hesitate to speak because I don't want to monopolize the microphone. But since there's no one else, um, I take the occasion to opportunity to, to put this to you. Um, I'm, I'm an old student of MOOCs, and I, through my experience, uh, there are most of, a lot of them are the best I ever had in all my life, and I've been to world's top universities, so I think it's really, I really appreciate the MOOCs and people behind the MOOCs such as yourself, and I was just wondering, I understand that Harvard would not allow the regular students to use MOOCs to count towards the degree. And I wonder how it works with you at Stanford, whether, because you do have courses that, that can, can be counted. And how, what criteria do you use to decide which one are going to be okay, eligible for the degree, or which not? And, I was also curiously wondering how do you how do you work out you know because how much people are going to pay because there's quite a difference between in in the cost. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So so th that's probably uh, so you you want uh, curriculum development uh, you want perspective on on the how we make those judgments and then you want the business model that might exceed the time limit that we have which is a quick response. But let me, let me just deal with what, what we have done at Stanford is experimented. Uh, there's a faculty member in electrical engineering, Nick McEwen. Nick McEwen created a MOOC, okay? Um, he leveraged the assets in the MOOC to show the students uh, the content of the course. And then he flipped 
the classroom experience to make it more interactive and problem-based. In other words, don't do your homework. Come to class and do your homework and build a problem session. Your homework is to watch the MOOC that I have developed in this content area. So you're, this is the concept of flipping the classroom. It actually didn't go very well. It did not go very well. Student, it, it was a great opportunity to learn. We studied the results. The students, Nick loved it because he got to meet these, fa so the faculty was, had a great experience. The students, not so much. They felt like they had to double, they were doing double work because they also had outside activity. So I, I think in this model, what we've done is a number of experiments. I don't think that there's a, uh, we wouldn't say take a MOOC and get credit. That, we would probably say leverage the MOOC assets and do something else in the classroom with your cohort uh, and peers. But it, 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 it's learning. So we, we're not, we're not going to say, um, we would tie it to the cohort-based experience at Stanford, and that's how we would leverage it. In terms of the business model, what's interesting about that, I can share a quick story. Andrew Ng, we, a famous guy doing the AI and so on. We, we actually took his AI list, the MOOC list that we have and own, we sent uh, an email blast, those who really want to test their mettle uh, against a tougher course, a graduate course, please take it. We actually had significant enrollments based on that email. They had taken the MOOC, and now they wanted a separate challenge, come really take a graduate course at Stanford. And, and we, had a, we had good success there. So a little bit of business model insight. Thank you again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the conversations in the hallway. Thank you.